fruit in its essence is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the light go out, darkness falls and indeed. If your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. There is an urgency today, an urgency to form Catholic Christians so that they will both know God and love God because by knowing him, you know, as you come to know him, you fall in love with him. This is something, you know, if the first commandment, Jesus said, is to love the Lord our God with our whole heart, mind, and strength. Now, can you imagine if you're to love someone that way, if you didn't want to know him? That would be absurd. And so, in wanting to love God, we have to want to know him. And I tell you, as you come to know him more deeply, you will come to love him more deeply. And then you will want to serve him. And then, as the old catechism used to say, we will be happy with him in heaven for all eternity. That's probably the first thing I ever read in the Baltimore Catechism, the meaning of human life. To know God, to love God, to serve God that we might be happy with him in heaven for all eternity. My dear friends, nothing has changed. That's still the meaning of human life. And in an age which seems to have forgotten what life is all about, that's what it's all about. John Paul II, the great pope of our times, has taught constantly that this catechism flowed right out of the Second Vatican Council, and it really did. If you take the Holy Father's apostolic constitution, Fidei Depositum, you look right in the, in the title, if you would take a catechism and look right at the first page, what you would see is on the publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church prepared following the Second Vatican Council. The catechism, the catechism flowed out of the Second Vatican Council. Now there have been some voices in recent months in the last couple of years who were worried about the catechism. They were worried it would turn the clock back and we would go back pre-Vatican to not true, not true. The Catechism is the direct result of the Second Vatican Council. If I would ask you, why did Pope John XXIII convene the Second Vatican Council? Think for a moment. Why was Vatican II convened? I'm going to tell you, right in Pope John XXIII's own words, why Vatican II came about. Here's what he said. The principal task I entrust to the Council is to guard and better present the precious deposit of Catholic doctrine in order to make it more accessible to the Christian faithful and to people of goodwill, all people of goodwill. That's why the council was called, to safeguard the sacred deposit of the doctrine of the faith and to better present it. Two things, safeguard it, better present it. The catechism is absolutely filled with references to the Second Vatican Council. Now, if you would take your catechism, if you, you don't have to do it now, you don't have time, but if you would look through it, and look at the footnotes, and then look at the indexes in the back, you would see one after the other references to the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council. Other than sacred scripture, Vatican II is the, about the most quoted reference in the Catechism. This is the Catechism of the Second Vatican Council, and it isn't anything less than that. This catechism teaches what Vatican II 
Paul. And that came right from the Holy Spirit through the fathers of the council. Pope John Paul II, who you know was one of the most important fathers of Vatican II, has stated that after its conclusion, the council did not cease to inspire the church's life. In 1985, I was able to assert that for me then, who had the special grace of participating in the council and actively collaborating in its development, Vatican II has always been, and especially during these years of my pontificate, the constant reference point of my every pastoral action in the conscious commitment to implement its directives and concretely and faithfully at the level of each church and the whole church. Now that's what the Holy Father says. Everything he's done, especially as Pope, has flowed out of Vatican II. He loves Vatican II. He couldn't be a true son of the church if he didn't. But many try to pose a false dichotomy between Vatican II and the Catechism, between the teaching of Vatican II and the teaching of John Paul II. There is no dichotomy. They are one. Vatican II is what John Paul II teaches, the Catechism teaches, that council, and all the other councils that came before it. So let's be sure we understand that we aren't going pre-Vatican II, we are taking Vatican II and going into the future. The Catechism helps us to do that. The process in the spirit of drafting the text of the Catechism is very important. On January 25, 1985, John Paul II convoked an extraordinary synod of bishops. Extraordinary because the ones who attended were archbishops of metropolitan sees throughout the world. It was on the 20th anniversary of the closing of Vatican II. This is a quote. The purpose, the purpose of this assembly, said the Holy Father, was to celebrate the graces and spiritual fruits of Vatican II, to study its teaching in greater depth in order that all the Christian faithful might better adhere to it and to promote knowledge and application of it. On that occasion, many of the fathers of this extraordinary synod expressed a desire to have a catechism or a compendium of all Christian doctrines. There had been a lot of confusion, voices that were crying out one against the other, contradictory voices, conflicting voices, and people were becoming confused, and the bishops knew it. And so they expressed the desire to have a definitive source book, one place you could look to see what the church basically teaches in faith and morals. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is the result of extensive collaboration. All the bishops in the world were consulted. In 1986, John Paul II entrusted the task of drafting a catechism to a panel of 12 cardinals and bishops. That was chaired by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. He's the prefect of the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and a great theologian. An editorial committee of seven diocesan bishops who are experts in theology and catechetics was chosen to edit. Then there were nine successive drafts of the catechism, each one including interventions and recommendations that had been made by the bishops, the bishops' consultors, theologians, catechists, Ecclesiology, um, um, departments of theology in the church, it was a work of tremendous collaboration. Now, anyone who would ever try to tell you that this is something the Pope imposed on us is not in touch with reality. All the world's bishops were consulted on this. Every one of them had input. All the ecclesiastical faculties of theology experts on catechesis and theology. You know, interestingly enough, when I was 
preparing to be ordained a deacon, I went on retreat. You, when you're going to be ordained, you have to go on a, a retreat before ordination, whether be ordained as a deacon or a priest. And so I went on my retreat to a monastery in Petersham, Massachusetts. And as I moved in to my room, uh, I noticed there was a priest moving into the room next to me. He was also a, a visitor, a retreatant. And I met him, and his name is Monsignor Michael Wren. He is the principal religious education expert for Cardinal O'Connor of the Archdiocese of New York. Monsignor Wren was there to study the first draft of the Catechism, the first one. He gave me a copy, and he said, I know you're not a theologian, but you're a seminarian and you're a, a Catholic layman. Would you review this? And he gave me a red pencil, and he said, and would you put in there what you think, just as an average Catholic, what, what you think it lacks and what you think it needs? Now, that was a rather extraordinary grace. That was the first time I ever came in contact with the catechism, the first draft. Remember, there were nine of them in succession. So I saw the first one, and I read it very prayerfully and meditatively over that week of my pre-diaconate ordination retreat. And I talked with Monsignor Michael Wren many times during that week. And then time went on, and I went away from my higher studies in Europe, and I saw some of those successive drafts. I saw the finished product very quickly in French, then in Spanish, and I worked with it from the very beginning. And so I had a, a singular blessing, I think, to have been able to see it right from the beginning. I can tell you it is a magnificent blessing for the church of our times. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit working through the universal church. All the bishops, all the experts had something to say. All of their interventions, all of their suggestions were taken into account. It was drafted and redrafted and redrafted. And then under the expert, and I would say inspired guidance of Bishop Christoph Schönborn, the finished product came about, a grace and a blessing for our time. And so we have to realize and remember that's where it came from. Now, the arrangement of the material. Number two of the Apostolic Constitution that introduces the Catechism that John Paul II wrote, it's called Fidei Depositum, Deposit of Faith. It states this, a catechism should faithfully and systematically present the teaching of sacred scripture, the living tradition, and that's tradition with a capital T, and I'm going to talk about that this afternoon, the living tradition of the church, the fathers, the doctors, and saints of the church to allow for a better knowledge of Christian mystery and for enlivening the faith of the people of God. That's what a catechism is supposed to do. It should take into account the doctrinal statements which down the centuries the Holy Spirit has intimated to the church. It should also help to illumine with the light of faith the new situations and problems which had not yet emerged in the past. And so in the catechism we have the old and we have the new. It's like out of the storehouse we bring the old and the new, as Scripture says. I kind of think of it this way. It's, it's like a river. There are two essential dimensions of a river. A river has a bed, a rock-solid bed. That's the unchanging teaching of Christ. Faith and moral, in its essence, cannot change because it is truth. And truth, in its essence, is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. And so the teaching of Jesus Christ, faith and moral, in its essence, can never change. It is immutable. That's the bed of the river. But in addition to the bed of a river, a river has a flow, a dynamism. And that's what changes. Every age in history has its unique set of problems. Cultures change. Men's way of thinking changes. And we have to meet people where they are. And so some things can and must change. That's the dynamism of truth. The truth itself doesn't change, but we can present that unchangeable truth in ever fresh, new, and more intelligible ways to the people of God. 
and to the world, to all men of goodwill. Four parts in the Catechism. This is part of the old traditional presentation of Pope Pius V. This was the Council of Trent, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. That was really the first universal catechism. Four essential parts. That's how the catechism is broken down. You know that. You've seen it. First is the creed, what we profess, what we believe. Second is the sacred liturgy, with pride of place given to the seven sacraments. Third is the Christian way of life, emphasizing the Ten Commandments, sin and grace. And fourth, we have prayer, the life of prayer, highlighting the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. Now, truth is one, because God is one, and God is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That truth is one, because that God is one. And so this teaching of Christ, this catechism, although it has four major parts, these parts are interconnected, compenetrated. You can't take them out of context. You read them as a oneness, as a unity. The Christian mystery is the object of faith. That's part one. It is celebrated and communicated in liturgical actions. That's part two. It is present to enlighten and sustain the children of God in their actions. That's part three. And it is the basis of our prayer, the privileged expression of which is the Our Father, and it represents the object of our supplication, our praise, and our intercession. That's part four. That's the catechism interrelated, a oneness, a unity. That's truth. That's the teaching of Jesus Christ. Now, the doctrinal value of the text. The Holy Father, in that same document that opens the Catechism, the Deposit of Faith, tells us straightforwardly what the value of the text of the Catechism is. This is a quote. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, which I approved June 25th last, that was 1991, and the publication of which I today order by virtue of my apostolic authority is a statement of the Church's faith and of Catholic doctrine, attested to and illumined by sacred scripture, the apostolic tradition, and the Church's magisterium. I declare it to be a sure norm for teaching the faith and thus a valid and legitimate in instrument for ecclesial communion. I declare it to be a sure norm for teaching the faith. That's what the catechism is. It is a sure norm for teaching the faith. And that's a blessing, to be able to have in one place a sure norm for teaching the faith. Now, we know there will be other catechisms, and there should be. You cannot teach first grade out of the big old catechism of the Catholic Church. So local catechisms will be derived from the catechism. But at whatever age level, whatever understanding level, those local catechisms must contain the essential content of the catechism of the Catholic Church. And if one would ever want run across one that where there was a conflict, you know which one holds. The big one. The Holy Father went on to ask all the pastors of the church and the Christian faithful to receive this catechism in a spirit of unity and to use it assiduously in fulfilling their mission of proclaiming the faith. Now, my brothers and sisters, let me just make a footnote here. We have been asked by the Vicar of Christ the successor of St. Peter, our Pope, to receive this catechism in a spirit of unity. Unity is a godly thing. Unity subsists in truth. It subsists in truth and is fed by love. Those who reject this catechism, who will have nothing to do with this catechism, not only are in disobedience, 
to the successor of St. Peter, they are fostering disunity in the body of Christ. This is a sure norm for teaching the faith. That's what the Holy Father wants, and I can tell you that's what our bishop wants. And the catechism will be the basis for all courses on doctrine taught in this diocese between now and the third millennium. There may be other courses, but this catechism will be the basis of everything of a doctrinal nature. Why? Because it is a sure norm for the teaching of the faith. That's a blessing to have that kind of rock upon which to build our faith. My brothers and sisters, this blessing we have, this catechism of the Catholic Church, is something that I want you to realize is not just some book filled with dry bones Doctrine. Now, doctrine is a beautiful thing. What is doctrine? Doctrine, quite simply, is what we believe. That's our faith. A lot of people think that there's somehow a dichotomy between loving God and knowing God, that somehow studying our faith can interfere with our lived-out experience of loving God our God, and loving each other. That is so far from the truth. Love of God, knowledge of God, are a oneness, a unity. We need to take this catechism, and we need to interiorize it. Why? Do you know what this really is? Oh, yes, the catechism of the Catholic Church. It is filled with words, many words. Someday I shall count them on a computer, and I'll tell you how many words are in this book, or maybe you'll do it and you'll tell me. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to give you a very beautiful principle that I don't want you ever to forget. All the words in this book can be compressed, distilled into one word, the eternal word. That's what this is all about, and that's why I love it, and that's why I promote it, because it's all about Jesus, the Lord of Lords, and the King of Kings. It is not just another book. It is not just another source book. It is not just another reference book. It is about Jesus, the Word, all those words still into one beautiful word, Jesus, filled with grace and power. And that's why I'm spending my time in Sacramento between now and the third millennium of Christianity, teaching, preaching, exhorting, trying to sell everybody on the catechism of the Catholic Church, because I'm not interested in book sales. I'm interested in Jesus. I want every heart and every mind to be filled with the one who is the light of the world. That's what this is about. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. And this is an adventure. We are about to launch out into the deep and prepare for a great catch, as the Master says. This is truth. This is immutable, beautiful, resplendent truth. We are in need of truth. For my brothers and sisters, truth is light. And you know you need light for life. In this universe, if we were to extinguish the sun and there would be no more life, what would happen? What would happen is that life would cease to exist. We need light for natural life. We need the light of truth for supernatural life. When lies begin to take the place of truth, when truth is called a lie and lies are exalted as though they were the truth, an inversion of reality takes place. Things are turned upside down. You'll call a lie the truth and truth the lies. 
good is evil, and evil becomes good. That's like the analogy of inverting the poles in an electrical current. You put the positive where the negative should have been, and the negative where the positive should have been, and what happens? The power fails. The lights go out. Darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how deep, how very deep will the darkness be? And so the catechism is about light. It's about life, life in Christ. The teaching of Jesus Christ. That's the truth. And he said, if you are my disciple, you will obey my commandments, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, my brothers and sisters, some of these classes are going to run into each other. We're going to probably end a certain presentation at a certain point, then I'm going to bring the second one in. I don't know how we're going to edit all that out in the technology, but we're going to figure it out. But what we do with the catechism, you know, and I'm now going in really to the second phase. You see how well I've done? <laughs> I already finished the first class. Amazing how I got through that. Usually, I have too much to say, and I can't shut up, and an hour comes and goes, and I'm still talking. Well, I'm going to talk about catechetics now. You know, we have a catechism. You know what you do with the catechism? You catechize. That's called catechesis. <laughs> Amazing. My, you know, my, my computer, when I do a spell check on it, okay, you, this might happen to some of you. I was writing an article, and I have all these words, catechesis, catechize, catechesi credende, and all those things about catechesis, and my poor computer and the spell check keeps flashing up these words it never heard of. And I have to keep putting them in so it'll remember it next time. That word is an interesting word, catechism, catechize, catechesis. It comes from a Greek verb, katekeo. It means to echo back. And I might add, echo back faithfully. That's what catechesis is. An echoing back faithfully of what we have heard. It reminds me of another Greek word, karax. That's what the word kerygma comes from. You don't have to remember these Greek words. A karax was a herald. Now, what does a herald do? A herald would come into the ancient cities announcing the message of the king. He would get in the city square or in a prominent place, and the herald would announce a message from the king. And he'd better announce it faithfully, too. <laughs> Catechesis is an echoing back faithfully of what we've heard. Now, I'll tell you an interesting thing about our Christian faith, about our Catholic faith. We don't make it up as we go along. It's something we've received. It is a sacred deposit. I'm going to talk a lot about that this afternoon. It's something Jesus gave to his apostles, in which they in turn handed on to their successors, the bishops, in union with the Bishop of Rome, the successor of St. Peter, the Pope. We have an identity crisis today. This identity crisis at this time in history is very painful, and it's been causing a lot of trouble. It goes something like this a priest or a religious sister or a married person or a single lay person, whatever your state in life might be, begins to think, I don't know if my vocation or state in life is relevant anymore. This was per particularly pronounced back in the 60s and 70s. Many priests left the priesthood thinking that their vocation was somehow not rel relevant to a rapidly changing world happened to many of our religious sisters. Divorce is the product of this. I don't want to be married anymore. It just isn't working. I, I, that state in life isn't for me. Identity crisis. Oh, it happens, and, and it happens to 
many of us, maybe even most of us at one time or another, it's painful. There is a very simple answer to this. I've already given the answer right from the outset as to the identity crisis. If you are wondering who you are, if you are wondering where you came from, if you are wondering what your life is all about, if you are confused, if you are discouraged, if you are in pain because you don't know who you are, where you came from, or where you are headed, I didn't even say anything. <laughs> I can point one place with the answer to all the pained questionings of the human heart. Right there. Jesus. Crucified and risen. Do you want to know who you are? Right there. You're made in the image and likeness of God. And Scripture tells us that the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, is Jesus. That's the image, the image in which we are created. And so we know something about his life, and we know something about his death. We know something about why he entered time and space. We're going to be learning much more about it. We know that he was born to die. We're born. We die. Why are we born? Why do we die? Why do humans suffer so much? Why do bad things happen to good people? You look at Jesus on the cross, and you can begin to discern the answers to many difficult questions. You go back to the old catechism, and it's right there in the new one as well in so many words. Why am I here? Young people often ask me that. What, what's the meaning of life? You know, wh why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? How often young people in pain have come to me ready to die. Do you know that suicide is fast becoming the number one cause of death in Western civilization? Young people have so much to live for. We live in a society that's oriented towards youth. And if it's so good, if our society is so perfect, then why, oh why, are our young people killing themselves at an unprecedented rate? I'll tell you why. It has to do with the identity crisis. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they came from. And they don't know where they're headed. You know why? It's not their fault. It's our fault. It is our fault because we have not shouted out with a full voice, unsparingly. Your life and your death is wrapped up in the life and death of Jesus Christ. The life of man is quite simply to know and love God. If we indeed come to know and love him, we'll desire freely to serve him. Then we will be happy with him forever, forever. My friends, I know that's a simple statement, and some of you are very educated people, and I respect greatly your sophistication and your education. But don't ever allow it to get in the way of a simple understanding of our faith. We're here to love God, and we're here to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're here to know him, and we're here to serve him. And that's the way we spend eternity with him. There aren't any shortcuts. That's the way. He said it himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Much of what we're going to be covering as we go on in this next hour or so is going to come from a source document that the Catechism uses constantly in this early section. It is called Catechesi Tradende, on Catechesis in Our Time. We have copies of it in the lobby. It is required reading for those who are taking this course for certification. Now, it's not terribly long. It is filled with, with information that's essential for anyone who's going to pass the faith on. Now, many of you are here not because you're professional catechists or 
religious education teachers. You're here because you're family people, moms and dads, grandfathers, grandmothers, or just Catholics who want to know their faith. Read that document, too. You don't have to. It's not required for you. You're not going to be tested on it. But it's so beautiful. Pope John Paul II tells us about catechesis in our time. The fourth general assembly of the Synod of Bishops was on catechesis. It often stressed the theme of Christocentricity, Christ-centeredness. All authentic catechesis must be centered on Jesus Christ. Now that seems so simple, it, it, it wouldn't require saying, but it requires saying. Very often in recent years, this, that, or the other program of religious education has beaten around the bush, and Jesus is not to be found in the center of that program. If Christ isn't in the center of any program of catechesis or religious education, it isn't authentic. And if you have a problem with me on that, I tell you, you do not have a problem with me. You have a problem with the Holy Father. And you don't really have a problem with him. You'll have a problem with Jesus Christ, who is the center of all authentic catechesis. Very simple. Now, there are two significations or meanings of that Christocentricity that we're talking about. At the heart of catechesis, Catechesis Tridende number five tells us, at the heart of catechesis we find, in essence, the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the only son from the Father, who suffered and died for us and who now, after rising, is living with us forever. To catechize is to reveal in the person of Christ the whole of God's eternal design, reaching fulfillment in that divine person, the eternal word, Jesus the Lord. It is to seek to understand the meaning of Christ's actions and his words and the signs worked by him. Catechesis aims at putting people in communion with Jesus Christ. Catechesis aims at putting people in communion with Jesus Christ. Only he can lead us to the love of the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit and make us share in the life of the Holy Trinity. That's from Catechesis Tridende number five, quoted very frequently in the Catechism. That's the first meaning of Christocentricity in Catechesis. The person of Jesus is at the center of all authentic Catechesis. Secondly, Christocentricity in Catechesis also means the intention to transmit not one's own teaching, or that of some other master or teacher, theologian or writer, but the teaching of Jesus Christ, the truth that he is, which truth he communicates. Remember, the truth is not a something. It is not a mere abstraction that we dredge up out of a book of theology. The truth is not a something, the truth is a somebody, Jesus is his name. In catechesis, it is Christ, the incarnate word, who is taught. Everything else is taught with reference to him. Let this one sink in. Now, I know this is second nature to many of you. Please forgive me if I pound away at points that you already know very well but I need to hear it too. You know, no matter how well we know these things, it helps to be reinforced in them. And so many of the things I'm going to be saying, you've heard them before. I can't come up with anything new, 2,000 years old. And so, in essence, catechesis is teaching Christ. Who teaches Christ? Christ teaches Christ. In catechesis, it is Christ, the incarnate word of God, who is taught. Everything else, that we teach is taught with reference to him in catechesis. And it is Christ alone who teaches. Anyone else who teaches to the extent that he is Christ's 
spokesman enabling Christ to teach with his lips. Every catechist should be able to apply to himself the mysterious words of Jesus. My teaching is not mine, but him who sent me. This is a theme, dear, to the Gospel of St. John. Even Jesus, the Son of God, the eternal word, said this teaching is not mine, but the one who sent me. Now, who are we to think that we can teach something other than what he taught? And what he taught was himself. Likewise, with St. Paul, we have to be able to say, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. What I received from the Lord. I can say this from my heart. What I have received from the Lord, I also deliver to you. And you can say it too, what you have received from your Holy Mother, the Church, in her authentic teaching and faith and morals, you pass that on faithfully to others. You echo it back. You're a carax, a herald of good news. You don't make it up as you go along. You hand on what you've received, the teaching of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the teacher, as I said. Jesus is the only teacher with a capital T. Remember, they called him Rabbi, Rabboni, teacher. And he said it rightly, do you call me teacher? There is only one teacher, and his name is Jesus, the teacher with a capital T. Now, I'm going to give you a very important principle right now. If you get this one right, you will get them all right. Very important. Okay? We're all teachers in some sense. We teach by our example, sometimes with our words. St. Francis of Assisi once said, we should preach the gospel to all creatures, and sometimes we should even use words. <laughs> Very profound. Very profound. We will be effective teachers of the faith to the degree that we enter into the life and mission of Jesus Christ. Teaching the faith is not like teaching anything else, although we can use some of the methodology, the pedagogy that is common to other sciences. We should draw from that pedagogy where it fits. It's not like teaching mathematics or biology. It's very different. Why? Because those are empirical sciences and they're finite. What we teach is Jesus Christ. And the only one competent to teach him is him. We aren't competent to teach Christ except to the extent we enter into him. It is more of a spiritual work than an academic one, although academic pursuit is very noble and very beautiful and to be esteemed. But I tell you this, you can have 10 university degrees. You can be fluent in Aramaic, in Latin and Greek, you can have a mind like a computer, but if you are not endowed with the same Holy Spirit that inspired the Word, you will remain an outsider and an amateur. You will never pass it on to others. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, that's how you'll teach others. Enter into his life, enter into his death, enter into his mission, to that degree, you will be an effective teacher. This is such an important principle. The spiritual life precedes our ability to be effective teachers. You know, I have some people that work with me in my own order, lay people. If I were in charge of teachers, and I never will be, but if I were in charge of teachers of the faith, I am in a very limited sense. But I, I'll tell you, I, they're probably all praying, oh, please, God, I'll do anything, but don't <laughs> let him. I don't blame you. But I'll tell you what I'd say. I'd say any teacher of the faith, you've got to spend an hour a day before the Blessed Sacrament. You'd better have an authentic devotion to Mary, and you'd better be absolutely dead center on the teaching of the magisterium, or you can't teach. You're not able to do that. 
You see, to teach Jesus, we have to become who we are, the image. Created in his image, we decrease so that he might increase, as John the Baptist said. And one day we can cry out with total truthfulness, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me as I live my human life. But it is now a life of faith in Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. I live and I move and I have my being in him. And to that degree, I am a teacher. And to no other degree can I be a teacher. And you will never teach the faith until you enter into his life and his death and his mission. And so teachers, all of us, do that. And if you do it, if you are faithful, he will be faithful to us. That's what it means to be a teacher, to enter into the teacher. And so it's not merely an academic exercise. It is not merely a question of a grand intellect, a great memory, a great ability to articulate. All those things count. They are beautiful. But what really matters is if you enter into his life, that you have faith in the Son of God, who loved us and who gave himself for us. God bless you.